Okay, but mine ain't seen us go through this a bunch of times. Uh, Poka, uh, the first one on the wall is a Poka Kanyani. She's a woman from the north of Ghana. Uh, we'll go through this quickly. Basically, what she's known is for having used that pistol to attack and kill the head of, the, of a slave raiding delegation. And since she was able to kill him, uh, that served as a deterrent for other groups coming into her area. They call that the pestle turned to blood. So that's an area called Bukeri, which is in the, the uh, Bogatanga area of Ghana in the northern part of the country. Uh, Queen T, this is where I uh, introduced the children to uh, the fact that ancient Egypt, ancient Kemen is a black civilization because of course they've never even heard anything of the sort or kind. And they have all kinds of you know, comic books and everything, Bible literature, you name it, with everybody, of course, in Egypt being uh, European or Arabish looking, something other than, than black. So 18th Dynasty Queen, the mother of Amenhotep Tep the Fourth, or Akhenaten, and then I tell about some of her exploits in terms of just her power and influence as a queen. Uh, Marcus Garvey, uh, up you mighty race, you can accomplish whatever it is you will what you will or, or desire to do. And so uh, I explained to him that them at the Universal Negro Improvement Association, the largest black organization the world has ever known, and of course about Garvey's philosophy, which I was talking about earlier today, which is building something of substance or consequence on the African continent. So we have a base from which to uh, have power, influence, and safety. Now, Kwame Nkrumah, of course, a lot of you will know that he was the first uh, president of, uh, of modern-day Ghana after the colonial times, um, and really the first, you know, Ghana being actually the first uh, African nation to, to come out of colonialism and form a, form a state. Uh, I put this quote up here, not so much for the children, but more for the adults, where because they all know about Nkrumah, but they don't know about Garvey. So it was all of the big brain Europeans that uh, Nkrumah read, the one that had the most impact on him was philosophy and opinions of Marcus Garvey. That gives some context for the teachers and the adults and even some of the older students about how powerful Garvey really was if he had this kind of influence on their, their main man here. So the Black Star line, all of that comes from Garvey. And the children here, you know, the Black Stars is the name of their football team. All of that's from Garvey. Uh, the place we're in now is actually not prom prom, it's called Nuningo. So uh, the founders of this place is uh, um, Jonas Kabu, the businessman who founded this area. And then we had Tejangma the first, who's the first chief of Nuningo, where we're standing. So we'll circle around back here. Uh, I have the Jamaican, Ethiopian, uh, Ghanaian and our red, black, and green flags up here, kind of, uh, you know, kind of representing the the diaspora, uh, if you will. And I'll probably move some of these signs. Around. The Jamaican one's been there a long time, so is the Ethiopian one. I might get Haiti, and you know, so switch some of these out. Uh, Lea Zare is uh, welcome in the what they call the Bruni language. As you go around, you'll see a Kwaba everywhere. That's the Akan for welcome. Uh, Leazare is, uh, is when you get to the north, that's one of the major languages. All right, we start with the uh, main part. All right, we start with uh, Eve. Um, this is where I let the children start talking to the children about uh, Africans being the parents of, of humanity. So our species, which is Homo sapiens sapiens, the very first ones were found somewhere around 200,000 years ago in Eastern Africa. Uh, no one left the African continent till about 70,000 years ago, which means for two thirds of human history, no one had left the African continent. So if you look at the diversity we have in some of those things, that's part of the explanation of that. Of course, the children always want to know, if this was the parent of humanity, then how did other people become uh, Chinese and European and Indian and white and all the rest? And you know, that just has to do with 
with um, environmental factors, you know, thousands of years and migrating to different places, you lose melanin, things right. change, and that what that's about. So I explain that. And of course, you know, Ghana, Ghana being a deeply Christian country, you know, it's like every fourth man is a pastor, it seems. And so it, almost invariably somebody's got to, you know, challenge the idea that, you know, this thing started with black folk. But this is how deep it is because once again all their Sunday school literature shows the same Adam and Eve we saw in our Sunday school literature, you know, that look like some white actors out of Hollywood. So we have to uh, straighten that out. And the thing is, uh, the younger ones are more likely to believe me than the older ones. And that's just, a, that's just purely a function of how long, how long they've been exposed to this uh, propaganda. So now we move to uh, Chinua Chebi. A lot of people have, have read Things Fall Apart, which I think is, is a good book. Unfortunately, sometimes it's the only book you read. They have people read in it. And it gives kind of sometimes a sense of, um, you know, some people have said they felt a sense of hopelessness after reading it. But it's, if you have to read a lot more work to see how good that is in the body of the rest of the work. But anyway, uh, Anne Hills of the Savannah, Man of the People, all of these, no longer at ease, all of these books by Achebe, who's just a great writer who brings you into the story. Asa Hilliard, I mentioned him a little earlier. He's out of Atlanta uh, by way of Texas. Um, a psychologist, uh, Egyptologist, historian, all the rest. He had been, um, he'd also been installed as a chief here in Ghana down in the central region. Just an all around brilliant, motivational, loving, African people, brother. That's Asa. Yeah, Santua, are you all, are you guys going to Kumasi? Oh uh, yes, sir. Uh, okay, so when um, you go to Kumasi, you'll hear more about Yah Santua and you, and the uh, you know Queen Mother of Ashanti and the Jisu struggling against the British. One of our strong, strong warriors, uh, lady female warriors. Didan Kumasi. Uh, Ghanaians kind of hear the word Kumasi because Jerry Rawlings, their former president named his son Kimathi, but Didan Kimathi was head of the Land, uh, Kikuyu Land Freedom Army, which uh, was derogatorily called the Mau Mau when we were growing up. Uh, but they, was, they were the ones that, you know, took to the forests and the hills and mountains and streams to fight the British to try to maintain, you know, their sovereignty uh, against them. This picture was taken after he was captured, but you can still see the defiance in his face. That's Didan Kimathi. Uh, speaking of defiance in the face, we got Sister Nzinga. Uh, once again, this was um, going on 500 years ago, so we didn't have a picture. But I found a picture of a sister who had the look I wanted. And uh, I always say, I don't know what she looked like, but I think she had that look. Of course, she was the one who struggled against the Portuguese, basically for a lifetime, trying to fight against them, taking Africans out for the slave trade, and also just taking oh, right. control of her land and her people. So you know, you hear we we all sold into slavery. Well, you know, I mean, that's a complicated story. A whole lot of people uh, were trying to put a put a monkey wrench in that. Uh, Sergeant Ajete, Samuel Ajete, uh, Ghanaians know him as, as one of the three soldiers who marched on the British uh, capital here in Accra. The reason they were marching is they fought in World War II and they didn't get their due. You know, that's their pensions and their money and all the rest. So they were marching in protest, they were shot down by a, a mm. British major, and that sparked the Accra riots, was really the beginning of the unraveling of the colonial order. So he's kind of like one of the catalysts or sparks that, that sparked the beginning of the end of the colonial uh, dispensation there. Maurice Bishop, some of you, if you were in the United States in 1983, you remembered that uh, uh, the man you all voted for, Ronald Reagan, uh, <laughs> that we all voted for. <laughs> uh, they invaded Grenada, uh, basically to stamp out uh, mm -hmm. what was working there. You know, the African people there under Maurice Bishop had something called the New Jewel Movement. And they're raising literacy to almost 100 percent, health care, all of the things, and it was almost kind of mm -hmm. like what Castro did in Cuba, except for they didn't let it get that far. They have less than they only had 100,000 people in the country, so. There's no possible way they could have been a threat to the U.S., but they were a threat to, they were a threat as an idea of what you can do if you independently develop yourselves, and that's not what they wanted to see replicated in the Caribbean. Uh, a lot of you all now have seen this woman king, 
uh, which is uh, the homie female warriors. Uh, I didn't see the movie, but uh, you know, we talked a little bit about this leaning here when we were standing upstairs. But anyway, they were called Amazon warriors. That's uh, the Europeans who were looking back at some of the Greek female mm -hmm. uh, warriors in England. After they fought with Bahans and the other ones. Uh, they did a lot of fighting internally, but they also did fight against the French. Uh, they, it, did, it didn't take any of these countries too long to dispose of some of these uh, fighters in the more modern times because the difference between French military technology and what they were using was vast. But mm -hmm. they fought with what they had for as long as they had, and uh, that's why uh, we still give them credit for trying to stand for their sovereignty. Edward Wilmot Blyden is arguably uh, one of the two or three fathers of Pan-Africanism, um, born in St. Thomas in the Virgin Islands, uh, scholar. Uh, he's taught in Africa. Of course, he moved to Liberia, where he really made his mark as a scholar and academic a diplomat and, and, and even started a college there. That's perfect. Uh, I'm going to have to look him up in Liberia when we get there. The book, the book that you read is... Uh, um, Christianity, Islam, and the Negro Race, which is a very, very powerful book by him. Steve Biko, this is where yes. I introduce the students to apartheid. <laughs> Y'all getting hot? To apartheid. Seriously, uh, young, that was a thing, man. Most of the people have not heard of, most of the students, almost all of them have never heard of apartheid. So this is what we're working with. You know, we got students here in Africa, and I mean, I brought probably thousands through now. Very few, very few have ever heard the word apartheid. So then I have to explain what that is in terms of, you know, what the South, black South Africans were going through. And then, of course, I tell them something about Biko as an anti-apartheid activist. Um, you know, the South African student organization, black consciousness movement, how he was killed and all the rest. But um, how was he killed? He was killed with, uh, by white South African forces who basically captured him, you know, and, and murdered him. Yeah. Basically beat him to death. Beat him to yeah. death. Yeah, that movie was painful watching, brother. It was it was, it was painful watching. But the that movie cry with freedom. De yeah, with Denzel, a great movie, but it was painful the well, store to end. The problem with that movie is that they killed Denzel early, and then we had to spend the rest of the time <laughs> watching this other guy <laughs> talk about how great he was. You know, it's like, <laughs> so anyway, Hollywood makes the movies. You take what you can get. We make the movie on Steve Biko, and we should do something else. And that's, that's really why I don't get too angry about the movie. It's like, what do you want them to do? Make a movie that's gonna help you and not them? That's gonna show black empowerment to the yeah. highest level. <laughs> These people aren't exactly stupid. Uh, Sony Ali of the Songhai Empire, 1492. Uh, you've heard of Ghana Mali and Songhai being three of the great West African Empire. Empire. He was the founder of the third one and the largest one. So I tell the children, you know, he had uh, several hundred ships on his, uh, that were on the Niger River in his navy. He had the nation divided into 14 provinces, very well organized. And, uh, you know, we've run these powerful nations for hundreds of years, and we need to know about it. Because sometimes there's this narrative out that we, we don't know how to even run our own policies. And, of course, we run them first, and we run them longer than anyone else. Hans and I just mentioned of, uh, of the homie, the homie has been in. And of course, I mentioned about them struggling against the French. They call him the great shark. Uh, Mary McKeever, after I've actually introduced apartheid, I talk about her singing and her activism against apartheid, being kicked out of the uh, country for three decades until she was able to come back in. Uh, we really have some youngsters who play her part very nicely in our programs. Uh, Sheikh Ante Jop, more than anyone, he demonstrated the black Africanness of ancient Kemen or ancient Egypt, the scientist, Egyptologist, mm -hmm. historian, all around brilliant, brilliant thinker. Uh, and um, if you read him and Obenga and what they were able to do in the United Nations Conference on People in of Egypt, I think they pretty much closed the books on ancient Egyptians being of the African uh, race and culture. but. Just because they won the argument overwhelmingly doesn't mean the propagandists didn't keep on with the same stuff. So, but our thing is not to stop them from doing it. Our thing is to make sure our children have what they need, irrespective of what they put out there for them. Dessalines, some people see him as the real force uh, in the Haitian Revolution. Of course, Toussaint L'Ouverture uh, was, was the 
main name we know, but of course when they Toussaint was deposed, Dessalines took over when they declared independence from France. He was the first president and prime minister. Uh, they had the decency to give the people their name back because the natives called the place Haiti, the French called it Saint Domingue, actually. Um, yeah, and then when they won, they took it and they said, we're renaming this place Haiti in honor of the people who are almost all gone now, by the way, or even by then. Uh, George Washington Carver, um, the agricultural genius of the day. Yes, you know, he there was, was really no one close. You know, they act like he was down there whipping up peanut butter somewhere. But I mean, <laughs> if anybody's had a chance to go to Tuskegee and go to his museum, you'd just be shocked by the breadth of this brother's brilliance. I mean, it's just, brilliant. it's just more than you can comprehend given what they tell you. Julius Nerere, he was one of the more successful, I think, all around African leaders coming out of the colonial period, one of the founders of the OAU. Of course, he tried to make these principles that we use in Kwanzaa, you know, Nia and Moja and this and that, try to Kuji Chagali, try to make all of that real, you know, in the in the nation, the early nation of Tanzania, the Tanganyika that he was building. Plus he offered a lot of support, material support to frontline freedom fighters all around South Africa. Ephraim Mamou, if you're a Ghanaian, you'll know him as someone who has uh, written some of the songs that they sing at, at their national events. He's also, I like him because, you know, he just resisted European, British cultural imperialism by any means he had, whether it was the jest, the music, the songs, the language, everything. So if we had more people like him, I don't think the cultural penetration would have been as deep. Harriet Tubman, I My think girl. we knew her. Uh, you know, she, I, I tell this story every time. Most of the students don't really know much at all about slavery. Mm -hmm. And uh, when I was talking on this one time, the students started talking among themselves and I found out they, they thought they heard me say that we weren't paid. And I said, yes, I said we weren't paid. And they really got angry about the fact, <laughs> you know, so when they ask you guys for a little extra cash, that's because they think for 400 years you've been getting paid every Friday. <laughs> you know, and it ain't exactly like that. You know, not, not at all. You know, so, but uh, we talk all. about the brutality of slavery and other things. Uh, when, depending on how much time we have with this. A, a movie was made about uh, yeah, Harriet made Tubman. A movie about it. I've never yeah. seen it. But and it's, it's, it's the same situation also, but, um, you know, and that's why we have to make our own. Yeah, if well, we want it to be impactful and powerful, yeah, yeah. but it, it did a little something. At least it yeah, introduced you know, some people they to do some more research. And they take with that one, you know. But it's their move. So. so we tell people to do some more research, you know, you can watch these things. But Yeah, so Mora Michelle of Mozambique. Uh, he's one of our young freedom fighters, you know, who was, of course, struggling against the Portuguese there in Mozambique. We got some material support. In fact, launched his attack against Portuguese bases in Mozambique from uh, Nairi's Tanzania. Uh, he was killed, he was a nurse by training, uh, killed in an airplane crash, which we are pretty sure was orchestrated by South Africans. But uh, that's another one of the young firebrands who led his nation as long as he could and as hard as he could. Nanny of Jamaica, uh, born in Ghana, uh, went to Jamaica as a, uh, you know, as a child and became so powerful in terms of being a maroon and resistance, running away and fighting the British they finally just gave her her section of the island, said, peace. <laughs> you know. So this, uh, this is taken from the, um, uh, actually from their currency. I had them just draw the picture straight off of their currency in Jamaica. So, you know, and there's a lot of uh, heroes and people in Jamaica that, you know, have names like Nanny. Some people say it's Nana. You got Cujo, you got a Champong, you got Chermatang. You've got a lot of these different uh, people. And I, if you see the Jamaicans here, they go in the mountains and they're totally comfortable, you know, negotiating for food and everything. Even some of the, the items in the market still have the same name in Jamaica as they have here in Ghana. So they're really, really at home when they come here. Uh, Haile Selassie, or uh, as you know, as Rastafari. Um, have them here for a couple of reasons. Number one, you know, I mean, struggling against the uh, Mussolini and the Italians. Uh, you know, people had a lot of criticism, but I think they were doing what they could do with what they had. And it also brought a lot of Africans from the diaspora in who were trying to support him in that war. And of course, he 
one of the founders of the OAU also. So, and now depending on who, where the people are from Ethiopia, when they come down this wall, they either love them or hate them. So that's a whole nother thing. The internal <laughs> dynamics of the Ethiopia Amharic versus this, that, and the other. Uh, Pianki, 25th Dynasty Egypt. This was our pretty much our last fully black dynasty in ancient Egypt or ancient Kemet. Uh, coming up from the south, as Dr. Clark said, to show their brothers how to do it one more time. Mm. So when you hear Pianki, Shabaka, Kaharka, all of those, they come from that 25th dynasty Egypt. And this is the 25th dynasty. That means there's 24 before them. Dynasties lasting sometimes more than 100, 200 years. So there's been a lot of uh, a lot of Africans in the in the pipeline even before then. So when you see all these Arabs and everything in the movies, and the, even the Arab students are, are, don't understand it. They think they built the pyramids. They, I mean, they really, really think they built the pyramids. Yeah, you they think they do because you know. I mean, you can't tell them nothing else. Everybody uses their own propaganda for their own purposes. You know, they were about what, two twenty five hundred years late. But anyway, uh, Shaka the Zulu king. I, I like that. I like the brother in the movie, so I would used his picture. Uh, of course, they were able to uh, consolidate a lot of territory, uh, make it a little more difficult for easy penetration from outsiders from Europe and anywhere else at the time. And of course, you know, he revolutionized fighting and did a lot of things like that. Fannie Lou Hamer, you know, she's sick and tired of being sick and tired. Uh, a lot of the youngsters here don't can't believe that even when I was a child, it was difficult for my parents to vote. So when you talk about Fannie Lou Hamer, you're talking about um, someone who was struggling for the basic franchise for African people in the U.S. And as you know, she suffered a lot for it and exhibited just tremendous, tremendous amounts of courage. Tokbe Si, the first of uh, late 1600s, the Airways groups, uh, especially the ones who came from the south, the Anlos, uh, he's uh, kind of the person they, they uh, talk to about as the leader who basically developed the Ewe population in southern Togo and down here in Ghana. And then going on to the Gaz, I was kind of hitting some of the major uh, ethnic groups here in, in Ghana. The Gaz, of which the group here, Gaz Dangbe, is also Taki. part. Taki wow. uh, if you all, hopefully you don't get trapped in my cold market, but if you ever go, you'll see a big statue of Taki Tawia there. Turn of the last century, trying to maintain some level of sovereignty for his people in the middle, of course, of the colonial onslaught did the best he could to modernize and, and make the place livable. What I do here all of the time is I usually bring one of the young students, have them stand and let them choose which one looks the most like this man. Have him stand there. We might even take a few pictures. That's then when he's done with that, I tell him, by the way, now this is uh, Narma or Minnie's, the, and this is the actual head, because it's in, I think, British Museum somewhere the first pharaoh of the first dynasty of ancient Egypt. And that's his actual face. Mm. So <coughs> after we've already shown he looks exactly like the child that they chose that looked most like him. And then of course they're all shocked because all they've ever seen is Charlton Heston and Yule Brenner and all the rest of it. <laughs> so, uh, but, but uh, we let them know. And that's, you know, and I mean, even the teachers, everyone shut. I mean, if that's not an African, there, then there are no Africans, you know. And that's the first pharaoh. First dynasty. Amakal Cabral, my painter left the L off. For some reason I got to get him back out here. But, um, you know, they were touching these up for our, our program we had in, in November. Really one of our best all around leaders in terms of uh, just intellect, leadership, uh, battle, war savvy. He basically reduced the Portuguese army to nothing. And uh, they had lost so much lives and treasure that there was actually a revolution. Young people revolted in Portugal to say we want out of Africa, we want to get rid of all these colonial possessions. So he was behind the liquidation of the Portuguese African empires, or African imperialism, more than any other figure. Plus he's written um, Return to the Source, Unity and Struggle, some of these books that you can look find when you get back to the U.S. Imhotep, Around 2600, we're talking about BC, we're talking about the third dynasty now, world's first multiple genius, first medical doctor, uh, architect, um, scribe, poet, all of that, just multi genius. And we do the same thing. I'll have one of the children stand next to him, and then they'll choose who looks most like him. And then we'll explain to him that 
that's where medicine, formal medicine began. Uh, like I said, my, my painter here, he's gotten a little carried away. He's starting to lay, make Toussaint Louverture look like George Washington. <laughs> that's funny. <laughs> but uh, we, 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 we'll keep, we'll, yeah. get it, we'll get him back. Yeah, get, back him some more, we'll, get him some more hair. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you know, they have a few, uh, on the Haitian gourd or Haitian dollar, they have a picture of Toussaint. And it looks kind of like this, but if you look at some of the earlier videos, the ones that he originally painted look a lot more like what's on the money. It seems like every time he touches it up, you know, I think someone showed him George Washington. So, you know. <laughs> but anyway, we go. But anyway, uh, we know he whipped Napoleon's army. And okay, that's, that's Hannibal. Oh, no, not, not Hannibal. Okay. This is Toussaint Louverture. So uh, the Haitians, of course, I mean, the African students. One thing about this colonial education, they get to learn all about, you know, uh, uh, Napoleon being the greatest general and all of that. So then I said, well, he's the greatest general, except for the fact that the brother man here gave him a solid whooping and kicked yeah. him out of the country. Yes, so did. Napoleon, at best, was the second greatest general <laughs> in history. Because this one then <laughs> got rid of him. So that, that actually helps in a kind of backhanded way. <laughs> Uh, if you come from the north, whether it's uh, Burkina Faso or north of Ghana, uh, uh, Mamprusis, the Gombas, all the rest of those, they come down the line and knock Bewa. So he's kind of a the great, 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 great grandfather of most of the major northern groups. Uh, if you, when you go to Kamasi, you'll hear more about the Ashantahini, the first Ashantahini, Ose Tutu, the first, and then they'll give you the full story. A full story about a Confa Noche who, you know, was with him when they brought down the golden stool and all of that. You're gonna love it, family. The stories are legendary in Kamasi. Very legendary in Kamasi. Yes. So you'll see it when you get there. So and we whatever take... I can say will pale by comparison. Uh, Thomas Ankara, you know, we have this young, uncorruptible leader of Burkina Faso, which is a nation just north of here, and he was able to uh, do a lot of things in a short period of time. Unfortunately. Uh, the agents of disaster got to him and killed him early as a young man. But um, really, they, it's, it's kind of like, I say it's kind of like when they killed Maurice Bishop in a certain way. You know, he's saying he's not going to pay all of this odious debt that is just fake anyway because it's going to starve his country until the IMF and the World Bank, but we're not going down that road. So they had to make an example out of him and get rid of him for those kind of reasons, but we still keep him up there because you have to resist even against the odds. Uh, Menorenus of Kush, we're talking 60 BC now. Now by now the Romans have actually taken over in Egypt, but you know that's thousands of years past all of the glory. Mm -hmm. And uh, they decide they're gonna move south into Kush or the new, what we call the Nubia Kush area, which is kind of northern Sudan now, you know, something. But anyway, the Romans pushed, they ran into the Kandakis, which are the queens, she was the Kandaki at the time, Amenorenus, fought the Romans to a standstill, pushed them back into Egypt, and forced them into a treaty. And so, uh, so when you hear, there's a whole long line of these Kandakis with these kind of long names, like Amenorenus and other ones. And uh, they held their ground as the leaders, because they weren't the sidekicks, they were the queens. And, um, they were able to maintain some level of sovereignty for something like 300 more years. So this is like, you see that when we went to battle with other people before the real industrial technical revolution, we always stood our ground and at least always uh, made the battle worth fighting. So we won a lot. And I like our young ladies, young girls, students coming here to know that uh, they also led some battles against some real enemies. You know, and so that's why, I, I mean, when I see these movies coming out, I'm not anti the movie because I've been talking about these things for a while. But, you know, it wasn't like the brothers all went home, you know. And that's what happens in the movie. That's right, I ain't, I, I, I ain't, I ain't happy about it. You know, I know y'all, you know, hey. If, if we just don't talk about it, then, you know, everybody will, yeah, okay, that makes sense. Even the young sister, you know, in the movie, the brilliant, you know, yeah, that's all cool, but like, they have some boy somewhere around there, do a little something, he's past the court. I don't know. Okay, <laughs> Menelik II, uh, great Menelik, of course, 
the Ethiopians were never colonized like all of these other nations because they basically were prepared to fight the Italians uh, as opposed to the other ones who were not prepared for the, the British and the French and the rest of them. So he saw what was going on, made sure he was ready, loaded weapons, ammunition, training. When the Italians came and tried to pull the flim flam on them, they went to war and he won the decisive battle 1896 at Adua. Uh, so thank goodness he could see what was coming. And that's a great mentally. Malcolm X, of course, we all know Malcolm. Uh, what the children here want to know more about it, even I talked about his, you know, greatness and his motivation for a lot of us and all of that. But they're asking about the X, you know, mm. and then I explained to them. And this gives me an opportunity to talk about how we lost our names and lost a lot of these things, even to the extent that we have a little skit that we do uh, about this loss of names, where we basically take a family here, you know, take a bunch of children and a teacher, make them like they're the, the, the father, the mother, and the children, all with the same surname, and then we go drop them off and all, you know, drop them off in, in Brazil, and they get a Portuguese name, drop them off in Cuba, they get a Spanish name, drop them off in Martinique, they get a French name, they get an English name, just to show how arbitrary one family within 30 days can end up with five, you know, even a Dutch uh, surname you know, just because uh, they had the power to take our names. And that really resonates with the students too, because it's hard for them to imagine just over some short period of time, now you're somebody else. And not only that, you're not gonna see your mother, father, sister, or brother again. It's not easy. Just way another one of the great Zulu fighters um, fighting against the British. And as I always say here, this is a where you can really clearly see that our men who were fighting, they had the valor, they had the persistence, they had the bravery, they had the strength, and what they didn't have was the, was the uh, machinery. And that's how this great Zulu warrior class was, uh, <coughs> was overwhelmed, you know, against the British in those wars, anti-colonial wars. Akhenaten, ancient Kemet, of course, here we talk about him being if you look them up, they call them the father of monotheism, that is Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And of course, a lot of the things that, a lot of the things that, um, that took place in that Nile Valley in terms of spiritualism, religion, is of course what we see in all of these other religions much, much later because a lot of it was lifted directly out of here. And not just lifted out of here, I mean, it migrated out of uh, the Nile Valley to form a lot of these other major religions. Now they've been taken over by the people, they've been perverted beyond recognition, but that was a source, at least of the three major ones that we talked about, Christianity, Islam, and, and Judaism. Bob Marley, um, you never heard of Bob Marley, then we might as well all just go <laughs> that's, that's the baddest bad man there has been. Not only was he just a brilliant, writer, singer, performer, but uh, the content of his work uh, raised the consciousness of a whole, 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 whole lot of black people. So that's our man. Uh, Wangari Maathai of Kenya, she's the one that won the Nobel Prize for planting all of the trees, but if you get a chance, there's some documentary out on her somewhere that really talks about her political orientation and why they had to give her so much help. So it wasn't just planting trees, it was challenging the whole social order and how the economy functions, you know, in the service of the, of the wealthy and, it, and in the uh, you know, adversely affected the people. Uh, Singbe Pie, uh, Senke, probably uh, you've seen or heard of the Amistad movie or the Amistad book or whatever. Um, of course, they rose up and um, took over, mutinied the ship, called the Amistad that was there going toward Cuba. I always joke about this because it's true. I've had students here before and I always say it in a kind of provocative way. I said, yeah, they were right on the coast of America in this ship, and then they took, and they were gonna land on the coast of America, and then they took the ship over, they mutinied, they killed the, the, the uh, you know, the um, captain, and on and on and on. Because they, well, they wanted to bring that ship back to Africa, back home. And now, just to show you the state of the mind of the children now, they're like, well, you know, why, why, why would they want to do that? <laughs> like, you're, you, you made it to America, I mean, you're right there, and then you're going to try to find... 
you know, there's something wrong. Yeah. You know, that was, that was this guy. You might want to paint over him. <laughs> His judgment was bad, you know. But I mean, this is, this is how they got us. You know? So you have to explain to them what they were getting ready to go to, which was very hard for them to fathom, except for I've given them a fire hose treatment on, on uh, Harriet Tubman down there to try to explain to them what the horrors, horrors of slavery were all about in the Western Hemisphere. Fred Hampton, who was the chairman, we call him, chairman of Black Panther Party uh, of Chicago. Of course, the uh, oh, Chicago right. police, FBI, all conspired to kill him uh, because of his voice. Because the children always want to know why he only is 21 years old. I mean, what could the man have done? And I said, what the man did was excited a lot of people. It was making people talk about working in solidarity, in this case, even across uh, races and all of that, which. You know, he started the original Rainbow Coalition. But, but his son was here, Fred Hampton Jr. Did any of you see the movie about uh, the Black Messiah? And, uh, yes, uh, yes. Judas and the Black Judas Messiah. Judas and the Black Messiah. Well, in the movie, you know, the woman was pregnant. So his son, Fred Hampton Jr., was born, you know, after the chairman was dead. But he's come to the wall here and gave us a nice little presentation about Excellent. Fred. It was really nice. That was 2021, I think. Samuel Maharero, the Herrero people, who are the ones who were attacked and murdered wholesale. Really the first genocidal act, we, well, one of the first genocidal acts. Of course, we know we had a genocidal act on the Americans, too. Um, but these German soldiers who committed this, these heinous crimes, you know, because Germany was colonizing Namibia, I did a little research to find that it was there offspring, you know, their children, nephews, and that next generation of soldiers that, that took the techniques that were practiced and perfected, you know, the work camps and all of the mass killing and brought that to World War II. And of course, used that against the Jews and Gypsies there. So, unfortunately, we were part of the dry run for that second Holocaust, or maybe the third or fourth Holocaust. Oliver Tambo of South Africa, uh, of course, he was kicked out of the country like Mary McKeeva was kicked out of the country for three decades. Basically, he's an anti-apartheid activist. He did everything he could to keep material support, military support, diplomatic support, financial, anything else, to the people to keep that struggle going uh, for those 30 years that he was out of the nation. So really undergirding the ANC and undergirding uh, the continued resistance against apartheid. Uh, Agustin Neto of Angola. Uh, this is what I call him the Imhotep man instead of a Renaissance man because he was a doctor, he was a poet. Of course, he is a leader of the anti colonial struggle, wars against Excuse the Portuguese. And, uh, and I've, read some, I've read some of his poetry just in preparation for our last program here. And I mean, this guy was a real poet. I mean, he wasn't just, he wasn't just a hobby, he's actually very well known. Uh, Sabbath of Haiti. Uh, this girl started at nine years old. She would run away from the plantation. They would capture her. They would brand her. They would torture her. As soon as she got a chance, she'd run away again, over and over. And so really what I'm showing the youngsters here is just this kind of, uh, you know, indomitable spirit. It's like, I don't care what you do to me. I've got this kind of sublime madness that does not allow me to accept a life of bondage. And of course, on one of the uh, escapes, she eventually died bleeding to death, you know, just as a result of, of something that happened during one of her escapes. But never quit, never give up, never accept being a slave, no matter how much brutality is laid on me. Uh, Vibere, interestingly enough, there was a sister from Sierra Leone here. I've, I've always called this Vibere, and she told me a few, about a month ago, no, it's Vibere, so now I'm saying it right. Vibere is Sierra Leone. Uh, they fought, he fought the British on what we call the hut tax wars. And basically what happened there is the British, when they come into your place, they want to enslave you in your own country. Yeah. And, you know, make you work and dig and mine and all of that in your own country. <laughs> so the way to do that is, and they did this in Kenya too, they say, okay, the hut you've been living in for 10 generations is now a tax on that hut. And you got to pay that tax in pound sterling and whatever we would say pay it in. And of course, you got to work for us to earn the money to pay the hut tax on the hut you already owe. So my man said, let me let me hear that again. And uh, just a butterfly. 
and it was <laughs> perfume you got on. He liked it. <laughs> so he said, uh, run that by me again? Yeah, I heard you. They went and got his boys in his army, and they fought it out. And he, he had some very successful struggles against the uh, British, but once again, everywhere through that colonial period, the ones with the guns, the ones with the... Yeah, the military technology. Guns, with the tech, they, yeah. they ended up winning out. Felix Mumi. Fortunately. And once again, you got to think of why I'm showing these to the children. He wasn't a huge name in politics, but he was a young revolutionary leader coming up in Cameroon. And of course, they were coming out of the colonial period. So he came to negotiate, uh, you know, about their, their post-colonial period, uh, getting out and... They poisoned them with thallium mm -hmm. in Geneva, Switzerland. Mm -hmm. And the reason I like it here, put it here, is because, you know, these children, if they hear anything about, you know, people, you know how we are, we hear about Switzerland, Geneva, mm -hmm. we think of peace, we think of peace talks, we think of, you know, nice hors d'oeuvres at, at international meetings or whatever. <laughs> and, and this is what the children think. So when you say, no, this was in Geneva, they took this African, they poisoned him with thallium mm -hmm. there killed him. Unfortunately, they, they were really trying to poison him where the poison was going to take effect a few weeks down the line after he got back home and everything. But, but because they panicked, because he kind of wasn't taking the bait, they overdid it on one of the doses that he actually took. And he died within a few days. Mm -hmm. So it was clear to everybody in the world that they had poisoned him right there mm -hmm. and not die any weeks later in his, in his home country. So the lesson there is you don't have any friends. <laughs> well, like Dr. Clark said, looking for a friend, look in the mirror. Uh, Sekahuni of South Africa, uh, this brother struggled against the Boers, which were the Dutch uh, South Africans during the apartheid time. And then, of course, he turned around and had to fight against the British, too. Unfortunately, at the end, you know, he, was, he lost the same old reasons, plus a little bit of betrayal having to do with uh, like a half-brother who thought he was going to be on the throne. And of course, they put you on the throne. After you betray your brother, then they put you on the throne, give you about 15 minutes and boot you <laughs> off their neck, you know, so. But we never learn. We always think you're going to be the one that, that you know, <laughs> that, that, that beats the system. You know? uh, Sister Nahanda of Zimbabwe, she's a spiritual leader of what they call the first Shemaranga Wars of Resistance against the British. And they finally captured her, you know, they hung her. Then they cut her head off because, you know, as a spiritual woman, we were trying to put that to rest. Mm -hmm. uh, Martin Luther King Jr., um, I always try to explain that he was more than just a speech maker. Yes. But, uh, you know, when we have time, uh, we show other videos. I don't know if you've ever seen the one on um, Beyond Vietnam, they call it, that he gave the Riverside Church in, uh, in New York City. Uh, human rights and uh, uh, a lot of people, you know, see him as, okay, well, there was Malcolm, there was Martin. Some of this stuff, you know, they have constructed these dichotomies, right. not us. You know, as far as I can see, they were, you know, on the same continuum to continuum to African struggle, freedom, and respect. Yeah. Had Shepsut, same, yeah. huh? I was going to say same vision, different strategies. Mm -hmm. Had Shepsut, uh, ancient Kemet. This is what I like them to know about the female pharaohs, African females. So first of all, they don't know there's African pharaohs. So secondly, they certainly don't know there's African female pharaohs of ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet. We talk about her and her travels and her great temples that are still there, hewn out of the side of these huge stones and mountains. I've never been there. You probably, you've been to Egypt, right? Oh, yes, uh, Egypt. Um... Yeah. 2004 with Dr. Renoko Rashidi. Renoko, Renoko. And I, after all this time, I still haven't been there. Yes, yeah, uh, incredible. We're going to try. We're going to go in 2024. You know? okay. If you know, a business boom up, I may, I may invite you. Yeah, well, you know, we might uh, get the Ghana package, see if we can get up there. Yeah. Ghana okay. and Egypt, exactly. Kaliterat. Mm -hmm. uh, Kaliterat, um, you see, you have to look at the time again. Now, we're talking about 641 AD. Now what's happened by then, the Arabs have now finally, finally, finally come to Egypt. So this is 641 AD, everything, 3,000, 2,000, 1,000, everything has been done. The writing has been done, the pyramids have been built, the, the, the astronomy, the philosophy, the, everything in the world that, that you associate with Egyptian civilization is thousands of years old before the Egyptians even come on the block. So when they're there now, standing up next to the pyramids, 
you know, that doesn't make any sense. But anyway, what they tried to do is they tried to do what the Romans tried to do. They wanted to go south and conquer south. These are the Arabs. And just like running in a Menorahness with Caesar and the Romans, uh, the Arabs ran into Kaliterat, and he smashed them there in Nubia, sent them packing back to Egypt, and uh, forced them into a treaty that lasted 700 years, if you can imagine. So a lot of times when you don't see a whole lot of Arab uh, influence and a whole lot of Arab um, uh, impact coming down into the in the southern South Saharan Africa, that's because a lot of it got bottled up there that long ago. Because then you'll start seeing these these Arabs that are traveling 13, 1400 AD. But that 700 year treaty said you can travel, but you ain't coming this way. You know, you might if you make it over the mountains, that's your business, but you ain't coming down this road. So that's who who we were and what we could do at the time. Muhammad Ali, greatest of all times. And of course, I tell them not just about the boxing, but about what we know about Muhammad Ali and his resistance to being an imperial um, cat's paw. Uh, you know, not not allowing himself to be drafted and going to war and the rest. Uh, Latour Jop in Senegal, he was one of the uh, Damals or, or a chief kings of a place called Kayor. If you go to Senegal today, you'll see it's like a big fishing village now. Um, of course, the French tried to run their railroad through his territory, tried to take over a large swaths of his territory, and he said no. Fought him, fought him, fought him. Finally, you know, died in battle with his sons. But uh, he's a hero there in Senegal even today. Uh, we got Antonio Maceo. Antonio Maceo. Don't ask me, man. I left when I was eight. Okay. <laughs> I thought we were getting ready to get a lecture on Antonio. <laughs> Antonio Maceo was one of the two generals that led the Cubans in the war of uh, independence against the Spanish. So they called him the Bronze Titan. And I haven't been to Cuba, but people who have been to Cuba say he's, you know, got statues. He's very well known as having, uh, having basically been at the heart of defeating the Spanish and getting the, the freedom for the Cuban people. When I first looked at it, I thought it was Maceo, you know, like Maceo Parker, James Brown's mother. And, uh, Maceo, blow your horn. Don't want no chance. I will play it. Patrice Lumumba. Patrice Lumumba, the Congo, another one of the great young leaders who was coming up. Of course, he was assassinated fairly quickly by, once again, orchestrated by your tax dollars. Thank you. Uh, but um, one of the things I do with this Congolese, when I talk, I talk a little bit about Lumumba, what he tried to do in terms of protecting some of the southern provinces and the resources and all of that. But I also tell him about the 10 million Africans who were lost, uh, why in the hell would they start burning now? Sorry. Uh, the 10, 8 to 10 million Africans who lost their lives in this uh, rubber uh, harvesting. You know, because Congo had the biggest harvest, of, biggest source of rubber in the world. This is the time when all of the bicycles and cars and everything were coming online. And so what they would do is they would take, let's say the brother here, they would say, brother, we need you to go out. We need you to go out. Well, who is that? It's all good. We'll smoke this fire. Yeah, they, we have to stop them. Well, you know, people burn. But, you know, they can't burn because they don't eat. Uh, so we lost something like 10 million. And what they would do, uh, when they had you harvesting for the rubber, they'd say, okay, okay, brother, we're sending you out to go get rubber, and your wife is uh, staying with us. If you don't bring back the right amount of rubber, then they'll cut her hand off. And they send you back, and you know, then they cut the other one. So you have all of these pictures of these people holding up hands of African women and children, mainly, that they cut off because the fathers and the husbands haven't brought back their quota of rubber. But that's cold, you think that's, so we're talking eight to 10 million dead people. You know, we lost that many people in this. That's more than, than any other uh, hard-skilled Holocaust that we've known of. Now, 
you could go to you could go to to um uh to belgium at the time because they're known for their chocolates and they and not until not too long ago from what i understand i mean be in decades you could go look at the candy rack there you know when you go into their their belgian seas candy store or whatever it was and they would have these chocolates in the form of black hands. Yes. Mm. Yeah. You, you seen that? I watched a documentary. It was crazy how they did, you know, whenever they don't work, they cut off a hand of a family member or a child. Yeah, that's... Them work and yeah. Stuff like that. I was just telling them that. And then, but then to imagine to put them Making in chocolate, chocolate. chocolate. People yeah. going, I'll have three of those yep. and one of those. Oh. Oh. Yeah, dark chocolate. That. Oh, these are, you know, these are your development partners. Mm. <laughs> anyway. <laughs> We 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 got to think hard about who we, who we hook up with. All right, and Kwabanika, of course, he's another freedom fighter against the Germans there in Tanzania. Um, he was a member of the Hehe he group of Tanzania. Of course, they cut his head off too. Took it back to Germany. You know, had it in a glass case for for what for how long? No one knows. But I'd like to let the children know that you know this is how they roll. Uh, Robert Mugabe, of course, of uh, Zimbabwe. You heard a whole lot of bad things about him. But I always tell people, if you watch the BBC, British Broadcasting, they say he's one of the worst Africans that ever lived. And as soon as they say that, I call my painter. Mm -hmm. <laughs> hey, man, come on out. They say, <laughs> so I don't have to read much more about him. But in reality, you know, he struggled uh, to get the land back for the people. You know, you got to get that land back. And he had promised his people he was going to deliver the land. The British had promised them they were going to give him the land. They were going to fund the people who to, to buy the land, get it back to the Africans. Of course, British reneged, and uh, they had to start kicking the people off. So that's when he became the demon of, of the world. Uh, the Honorable Elijah Muhammad, you know, of course, we know uh, a lot about his personal life and some of those compromises of people a lot of time on, but I think we don't spend enough time on the fact that there's no one that's really built more of a nation inside of a nation for black people in America than the nation of Islam at the time. I mean, we're talking, you know, businesses and schools and bank and trading and all kinds of things, you know, transport company, restaurants, and, and say nothing of all of the people that they brought out of prison and all those brothers that they pulled up. So if we look at a nation inside the nation, we got to be careful not to throw the baby out with the bathwater when we talk about someone like this. That's not to condone some of these other things that we've known and read about. But I think we have to be balanced in our assessment. Ida B. Wells, um, of course, uh, the children always think this is Michael Jackson. <laughs> I always joke and say right around Thriller, somewhere around there. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you know, not, not at the end, of course, and certainly not at the beginning. But I, Ida B. Wells was an anti-lynching crusader, where she had close people to her, friends and family who were lynched, which is part of what motivated her to do that. She was a journalist, always under threat herself, and has uh, really gone down in history as one of the most courageous um, Africans that we've had in the U.S. John Akello, he's another one who's not that well known, but um, in Zanzibar, the uh, Omani Arabs were sitting on the African, native Africans' heads for generations. And no amount of negotiations and pleading and talking seemed to budge them as they, you know, ruled over the majority of native Africans. So one day, not one day, but they had an afro Shariza party and a movement, and uh, he's the leader of it. They stood up and uh, had a very, very violent revolution against those Arabs that had been sitting on their heads for, for generations. A lot of people say they don't like it because it was violent. It was just sometimes, you know, when you're talking nice, people don't always want to move, especially if they have advantages. So, brother did it his way. Uh, Fela Kute, a resistance musician, and uh, Fela Kute's son, uh, Sion. Kute came here and gave us also a nice Excellent. little discussion yeah. about, about Fela. I have to find the video and get it to you. Um, of course, he was writing music and performing, you know, and the government was torturing him and jailing him and beating everything else, but he didn't care. I mean, as soon as he gets out of jail or out of the last beating, 
he go write a song that was more vicious than the last one, you know, in terms of just political political courage in his writing. And of course, uh, really, really influential in all of this West African music that you're hearing today. Or What's Africa. his name? Sometimes pronounced Fela. Yeah, Fela. Oh, okay. Same so, I, I probably said Fela, but Fela. Yes. Okay. Fela Kuti. Uh, Zumbi of Brazil. Zumbi, yes. Okay, now if you go to Brazil and go deep into the mountains of Brazil, uh, you can still find the, the area which was called Palmares. Palmares was the largest. Uh, actually, it was the first. Someone brought it to my attention. We we're talking about Haiti, but actually, Palmares was the first. Um, black nation in the Western Hemisphere because, you know, they escaped from the Portuguese plantations, went to the mountains, started their quilombos, which is a, what they call those settlements. And it was big, organized, political, and lasted for over a century. So really, if you look at that as a nation in the Western Hemisphere, that was the first one. And of course, Zumbi was one of the, one of the main founders and, and leaders of that. Uh, still in Brazil, we got um, Nascimento. Nascimento for some of us who were trying to figure out what was going on in the African Brazilian political, historical, uh, cultural scene, he was the one that was doing the most writing. And he started the Black Experimental Theater down there. Of course, he was in politics. He was exiled. He was prisoned. He went through all of those same things, just trying to have some black dignity and expression and go against this thing in Brazil where they try to pretend there's no race issues. You know, <laughs> it's just everybody's Brazilian. Just so happens the darker ones are on the bottom. Uh, yeah, like a it, joke I heard one that time. That is Brazil. Yeah, and I've been there a couple of times, and yeah, it's, they, uh, they're very race conscious. It is unbelievable. And although they talk about they're not. So there's a joke I heard one time a, guy, a Marine. He was telling the guys, he says, "Come in, you're in this my, you're in my new Marine Corps, and in there here we don't have. We're all Marines. We're all green Marines. We're all green. It's Marine. It's no racism, no nothing." He said, "Now." Uh, some of you dark green Marines go in there and start cleaning, <laughs> cleaning up the, the toilets. They'll and, be Brazil. Light <laughs> green ones, you know. We're all green, you know. But you and I call two different things in Brazil. I think you're a little shade lighter yeah, than me. Yeah, yeah, you know. That's how they got it. Okay, but so that's... I wonder how they keep up with all this stuff. Uh, I know y'all are hot. Y'all doing good, though. Yeah, we are. Uh, and then Jean -Mo, we're surviving. He's the only person on the wall who's actually still alive. That's only because I didn't know he wasn't an ancestor. When I did it, and I always joke, I said, when we went to the internet to find this day he died, he was on there partying. So, <laughs> right. okay, so we had to add, you know, but my man's got a spot when he wants it. Of course, they had to fight against the, the South Africans who had colonized Southwest Africa and Namibia. So he was a leader of that anti-colonial struggle. Yeah, he's still around there doing his thing. Uh, Booker T. Washington. You know, people talk about compromise and Atlanta compromise and all the rest, but I think when we go deeper into Booker T's past, we realize that he was he was doing a lot for black people that we didn't even know and acknowledge Absolutely. at the time. People are always looking for these perfect uh, you know, yeah, yeah, organizers and, and leaders. And, of course, he's an institution builder in the institutions. And it's still With a man credit for his work. Is this the guy that taught Elvis? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't know if he taught Elvis, but I'm sure he... No, I, Elvis couldn't, no. Elvis, Elvis could. couldn't play on a get do nothing like that on the guitar. Uh, this is the great B.B. King, my daddy's favorite blues man. And uh, that's about all you need to know for him to get on the wall, you know, mm -hmm. daddy said. <laughs> but even if it wasn't my daddy's favorite blues man, he'd have to be one of the top handful of uh, American Africans I would have chosen to represent a musician because I was trying to get... You know, like I have Marley in the Caribbean, and I got uh, a Fela Kute there in West Africa. We got uh, Mary Makiba in South Africa, so we're getting somebody. So could have been him, could have been Gil Scott Heron, of course. And uh, so that's our man BB and his, his thing, Lucille. Walter Rodney from Guyana. Did somebody? Yes, that, yesterday we had some folks from Guyana. Okay. Guyana, of course, is, you know, South America. A lot of people confuse that with Ghana. And what most people know about Guyana is when the when they poison. You remember that? What was it Jim Jones or something Jim like Jones. that? Oh yes, yeah. When they drink the Kool Aid. Yeah, drinking the Kool Aid. Right, that was it. Jim but Jones. Walter Rodney was by one of our very, very, very finest scholars, writers, thinkers uh, coming out. And you know, we have a lot of brain work coming out of the Caribbean too, which is interesting. 
But uh, the book that all of you have to read is How Europe Underdeveloped Africa. Uh, Grounding with My Brothers is another one. But this man uh, was just almost beyond brilliant, political and revolutionary thinker. Queen Amina, who I think they made a movie on not too long ago either, is the House of Queen of Northern Nigeria, where she led her cavalry and she led a nation, huge trading nation that she was uh, in charge of. Eduardo Manlani of Mozambique, studied in the U.S., Ph.D., all of that. He could have laid low and got his, got his tenure or whatever they do. I think he went to uh, Northwestern or something. But of course, the Portuguese were, were ravaging this country in Mozambique, so they went back, started what they call the um, Frelimo, which one of his uh, protégés was Samora Michelle, which we saw earlier. And they fought, and they fought against the Portuguese in the anti-colonial wars. Unfortunately, he was killed with a, uh, a bomb, parcel bomb. They opened it up, blew up, and killed him. Garrett Morgan, we know Garrett Morgan from, uh, he's the one who invented the traffic signal. He's the one that did the, the gas mask. So I always like the children coming down to, you know, get a little insight into the inventiveness and the creativity, also of the African mind around the diaspora. Franz Fanon, if you're gonna think about a thinker, it's uh, Franz Fanon out of Martinique. He's a psychiatrist by training. Some of the books, Wretched of the Earth, which is a classic that if you haven't had, had a chance to read it, you have. Just having to do with the, you know, kind of a psychoanalysis uh, of what was going on during this whole colonial process with us and the people who were colonizing us. Uh, also, um, Black Skin, White Mask, that's another very important one. Franz Fanon, brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, Chilimbwe, he went to the U.S. and uh, became a, 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 you know, a, a theologian. But uh, when he got back to Malawi, of course, the British were still, you know, anti-theology or at least anti-theology principle. So he had to go back to war in his country against the British to try to see if they can clean it up and become a sovereign nation. Colonial struggle. Seiko Ture. Most Ghanaians know him as the one who brought Kwame, Kwame Nkrumah in, and Nkrumah was deposed. I have him here because uh, just his philosophy of being independent against the French. At the end of the colonial times, the French gave all of their former colonies a choice whether they wanted to stay in the French community or not. He said, no, thank you. So the French worked to try to destroy the infrastructure of the place before they left purely out of spite. I mean, Césaire, Césaire was one of the great, great thinkers, again, out of Martinique. Uh, he was a poet by, by, by profession, I guess, if you will, but an anti-colonial thinker. They had a movement called Negritude, you may have heard of a long time ago, which was uh, a French-African colonial, not colonial, uh, French-African, um, uh, you know, writing and, and, and poetry and all of that kind of lit literary movement. And he and a couple others started it. So back when you hear a Sheikh Anta Jeff and all of these Afro -French, African French thinkers in Paris in the 40s, they were all pretty much under his guidance and leadership. Uh, Samurai Touré of Guinea, by far the most effective anti-French uh, colonial fighter in West Africa, uh, moved all the way across West Africa. Unfortunately, he was never able to connect with the Ashantis, which is what they say he was on his way to do when he was finally captured and, and by the French. Uh, Kwame Touré, who was our own Stokely Carmichael, of course, born in Trinidad, uh, Howard University, a Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, and uh, one of the purveyors of the term black power that a lot of us coming up were hearing all the time. Of course, we have our master teachers, Dr. John Henry Clark, Dr. Yosef Benyakinen, uh, always available, always ready. And I don't know if you ever saw Wesley, Wesley Snipes did a program called um, uh, Great and Mighty Walk on the life of John. Yeah, that was a great Clark. documentary. And uh, you got to give Wesley Snipes credit for that. Wesley Snipes credit for that. It's a great, great documentary. Of course, everybody always asks me, where is Mandela? And I say, we left him in South Africa. I said, she's right here. Oh, there you go. There you go. There you go. She's there you go. right here. <laughs> Ask and you shall receive. <laughs> Winnie, the great Winnie Mandela, of course. He, 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 he unfortunately didn't make the cut. Well, you know, he was... He, he, 
He wasn't around the day we were doing the pictures. No, but I mean, everybody's given all that credit, but you know, what about Winnie Mandel? What about I the mean, one that was... This is the one who was there on the ground, you know, catching the heat, being tortured in prison and... and continuing the movement, continuing the movement, really. Continuing things, keeping yeah. things alive, yes. and then when it's all said and done, they throw her name away, and you know, you have this big Nobel Prize winner. So that's not to say I wouldn't put Nelson Mandela on the wall because somewhere along the line I will, but I would really like to see them get their land back. I was just reading something the other day about how bad a shape the black South Africans are in economically in that country. So when you go down here to ShopRite and the game and all of this stuff, Barcelia chicken and all yeah, of them all, all that's all white South Africans. These are people who we wouldn't have, 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 as Africans, wouldn't have allowed in our malls and in our countries and in these businesses back during the apartheid era because we knew who they were. Now they've come up, cleaned up their image, yes. given off a couple Nobel Prizes, trashed the name of Winnie, yeah. and they're making money hand over fist, and we're not resisting at all. So we lost that propaganda war, but that doesn't mean we have to lose it in the end. So Winnie's name will be up there. I come ask her every month, when should I put Nelson up? And she says, I'll let you know. <laughs> she ain't told me yet, so she, she told me not to, don't blame me. Well, she told me not to put the, the for you not to put it up there. Ah, uh, well, because you know, she said the jury's still out. <laughs> the jury's still out. And then Francis Press Wilson, who's taught a lot of us about uh, why it's not a good strategy to appeal to the the moral leanings of the European when you're trying to get where you need to go because there's another imperative at work that doesn't allow them to bargain in good faith. So I'll leave it at that. That's Dr. Francis Chris Wilson. Yes, my brother, once again, Any man. Any more questions? A great, mighty oh, walk. That was, that was a great, mighty walk. <laughs> one, hour one hour plus strong. There you go. An hour plus and this and over everyone here. Everyone be proud of yourself. You all survived. You, you all survived the, this? Yeah, the ancestral walk. Just like I hope everybody survived the canopy walk when we take them to the to the canopy family. This is this long walk we just did, family, and it was a beautiful experience and connecting the energy of all our wonderful ancestors who have laid a foundation. The family, let these things be an inspiration for our 21st century nation building. And then we're gonna to top it off right here, family, with this great building, great future visionary building, three floors tall. And look like you're gonna have a roof deck, right? Oh yeah, oh yeah. You see we're so you can see around the whole town. Yeah. What about some of the fruit trees you have on the property? Yeah, we're gonna have some more mangoes. You call out a few? I don't know. We, we got a lots of mangoes and neem and a lots of neem and. Uh, some other stuff that I don't even know. They have some uh, sour sap. They have some, you know, some different different things. You know, try to keep ourselves healthy. Uh, what we're gonna do here is the second floor is where I'm gonna bring where we're gonna have our programs. I think and I was mentioning. I think I was mentioning that before. Okay, is food ready. And so family, we're gonna close on this nice presentation and we're gonna head back up and we're gonna enjoy lunch. The journey continues. Thank you for connecting with us and make sure you check out our website, africaforafricans.org and link with us to join any of our journeys. Link with us if you just want any information on how you can support our brother Jerry Johnson here to build some incredible institutions for our children to be educated. And also, family, uh, from guest house to restaurant, this is a wonderful place where you can come, relax, eat, kick back, connect to uh, African diaspora energy. And this is what I'm basically telling everyone. Once you have land, you can build incredible, incredible things. You know, so this is a two and a half acre property or a two acre property, this is an estimate. And you have this wonderful establishment set up here. And I've been coming here since 2008. And all I've seen it, and all I've seen is just growth and development.
It took us a good 45 minutes to one hour from our Accra hotel to drive all the way here in Ningro Prom Prom. So top floor, restaurant, bottom floor is guest rooms and we're on our way up to enjoy a beautiful dinner buffet. Excuse me, our lunch buffet. We'll have something special later on for dinner as we jam at Jamrock in Accra.